according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter, beginning with the 10th verse. Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left the went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And the disciples urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. Christ. <clears throat> Won't you join me now, please? For a word of prayer. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, open our, open our eyes, open our minds, open our spirits, open us up to expand our horizons. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> My sermon text is the Gospel lesson, Matthew chapter 15. Actually, the latter part of it, verses 21 through 28, the story of the Canaanite woman. My sermon title for this morning is Mere Crumbs. Mere crumbs. This morning's pairing of biblical text is interesting, to say the least. <clears throat> the first lesson from Isaiah chapter 56 turns God's compassionate care for and uplifting of the foreigner, that is, gentle, those of race, ethnicity, Israelites, the Jews, God's chosen. In any among any group of people, race, culture, if you are an outsider, a foreigner, you are the other who does not belong and are an easy target for any number of injustices, prey even, vulnerable to the prejudices of the majority. Isaiah seeks to remedy this situation of potential division and isolation. Verse 3 therein says, Do not let the foreigner join to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, verse 6 continues, 
These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful. Their offerings and sacrifices will be acceptable, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. The reason that last verse sounds familiar to you is that that is the verse Jesus quotes for rationale while he is cleansing the temple in Jerusalem, driving out all the buyers and sellers, overturning the tables of the money changers. Foreigners are put on equal footing in this text with God's chosen people, the Jews. Psalm 67, similarly, has a universalism about it, embracing peoples far beyond the narrow confines of Israel. The refrain occurs in verses 3 and 5. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. While the psalm concludes, let all the ends of the earth revere him. The second lesson from Romans gives a theological reason or justification for such a concept of all people being despite racial, ethnic, or Jewish Gentile divisions. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. Jesus himself says in John's gospel, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also so that there will be one flock and one shepherd. And of course, Paul writes famously to the Galatians, there is no longer Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There are many other texts, to be sure, that could be quoted, but I think we all get the main point. Scripture testifies again and again to the fact that all are equal in the eyes of God. There is no longer any special chosen status because all people are sinful and God forgives all their sins equally through Jesus' sacrificial death. And yet all of us continue to make judgments in our own minds not along racial or ethnic lines particularly as it concerns foreigners or immigrants. That's why this morning's gospel text is so jarring and arresting. Jesus leaves Jewish territory proper and journeys to the district of Tyre and Sidon, a pagan and Gentile region north of his home in Galilee in what is today the nation of Lebanon. The apparent reason for this reclusive escape seems likely to have been retreat. He undoubtedly needed respite from the hectic, frenzied activity as of late. In Mark chapter 7, the only other parallel text for this same story, it states there that Jesus entered a house and would not have anyone to know it. So obviously, he is seeking rest and solitude. Yet, Mark wearily testifies, he could not be hid. He is discovered here in Matthew by a supplicant who is a Canaanite woman. Since the land of Israel was originally known as Canaan, she is an indigenous inhabitant of this area, predating the arrival of the Israelites from Egypt. In Mark, incidentally, she is a Greek, a Syrophoenician woman by birth. Again, the main point is that she is non-Jewish. She's Gentile. She's a foreigner. She's the other. On top of that, she doesn't approach Jesus discreetly or in a dignified manner, but rather appears to be loud, obnoxious, boisterous. The text says that she came out and started shouting. At least she has the common sense and wherewithal to address Jesus in Jewish terms, according to Messianic designations, as Lord, Son of David. Have mercy on me, Lord, Son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. And here's where it gets ugly. Many preachers and teachers and commentators either ignore this passage outright or try to dance around it somehow or even airbrush it in order to take the sting out of it. Verse 23, but he did not answer her at all. Have mercy on me, Lord. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. 
Not me, but my daughter. Not bothered, troubled, or inconvenienced by, but tormented. Not by a headache or a cold or arthritis, but by a demon. My child is tormented by a demon. The embodiment of innocence, attacked, debilitated by the embodiment of evil. And Jesus stands by and does nothing. What do you do, my friends, when you cry out from the depths of your soul and God is silent? What do you do when you are desperate and at your wit's end and Jesus does not answer you? who is aware of a demonic attack upon an innocent child and stands idly by. A God who has the power, but won't use it. What do you do, my friends, when God is silent? Especially in the face of unspeakable agony and anguish. The disciples appear not to appreciate her relentless insistence either, finding her annoying and irritating. They urge Jesus, saying, send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. When Jesus does finally speak, he appears neither kind nor concerned and says rather dismissively, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, i.e. not to the Gentiles. Jesus herein, about halfway through Matthew's gospel, is defining his mission more narrowly as God's anointed Messiah for God's chosen people, the Jews, his own people. Verse 25, But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. How many of you know when you are desperate, all you can say is, Lord, help me? Even in the face of protracted heavenly silence, you still beg, Lord, help me. You drop all pretense, all the particulars of your case, and reduce the 15-word earlier plea to this three-word plea, Lord, help me. Scripture is replete with examples of persistent faith, faith which refuses to quit or let go. Jacob wrestling all night with an angel, refusing to relinquish his grasp until he obtained his blessing. The hemorrhaging woman with an issue of blood pushing through the crowd to get her healing. Blind Bartimaeus on that dusty Jericho roadside hollering out for sight while onlookers shush him. And short in stature, Zacchaeus climbing up a tree to get a better view, ironically giving Jesus a better view of him. Somebody in here this morning can add your name to that list. Somebody in here this morning, though weary, worn, and sad, is just as relentless, just as desperate, just as perseverant as this Canaanite woman because her cry is your cry. Lord, help me. Verse 26 is uncomfortable, to put it mildly, as it really approaches a slur. It is not fair. Jesus finally, directly acknowledges this persistent woman to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. The children herein are the Jews, God's chosen people, while the dogs are obviously all others, all non-Jews, people like you and me. God bless this woman. I think my pride would have kicked in here if not earlier. And how many of us would have been inclined at this point to rise to our feet and exclaim, you're not going to talk to me like that. I still have my dignity and I'm not going to endure insults based on my ethnicity. Translation, who you calling a dog? Yes, Lord. 
She responds in a last-ditch effort, casting personal pride aside, and pulling out all the stops for her beloved offspring. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. There are many unsettling things about this encounter and this exchange, no doubt. But this woman's desperate plight leads, in her case, to an utter humility, wherein she can say perhaps what she ought not in most all other circumstances. Yes, Lord, whatever you say, whatever analogy you choose to make, just give me my crumbs. Just heal my daughter. Think of me, address me, however you choose. Just give me a crumb of deliverance, a crumb of healing. Love for another suffering human being, my friends, can cause you to take yourself totally out of the picture. When I think of crumbs, of what's left over, of what's not otherwise worthy of being collected and consumed, but rather is discarded and swept away without as much as a second thought. I remember Jesus' great, 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 several greats, grandmother Ruth, herself a poor, homeless, Gentile foreigner living among the Israelites, who survived by going to the fields and gleaning among the ears of grain. She did so because Leviticus 19 instructed the Israelites, the Jews, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field to its very border. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. Rather, you shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner, that is the alien or the immigrant living in your midst. Some call it charity, others justice. But Leviticus 19 ties it to a primordial memory. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall do him no wrong. He shall be to you as a native, and you shall love him as yourself. For you yourselves were once strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So in my sanctified imagination, I think when she humbly insisted on her crumbs, perhaps a DNA-encoded memory within Jesus' holy cells harkened back to a time when his own ancestor, his own great-great-great-great-great-grandmother Ruth, a foreigner from Moab, was reduced as a poor outsider to gleaning the fields of Boaz, whom she later married and with whom she had a son, Obed, the grandfather of King David, from whom Jesus descended according to the flesh. I think Jesus then recalled that injunction from Leviticus to allow for the gleaning of crumbs from these fields because you yourselves, his own people, the Jews, were sojourners and aliens down in Egypt where they were, of course, enslaved and oppressed. I think what then occurred in his mind was, who am I to withhold what has freely been given to me, to my ancestors and my people? I am here physically due to the crumbs and the gleanings of Ruth, a Moabitess. So who am I to withhold crumbs from this Canaanite woman? Jesus himself would come to know what it meant to be a rejected, persecuted foreigner of sorts. When John testified about him, he was in the world, but the world knew him not. He came to his own home, and his own people received him not. So he knew what it was like to be and to feel as an outsider. I think at this stage of his ministry, his understanding of his messiahship was still expanding, and I think that this woman was absolutely instrumental in that very expansion. Sometimes crumbs are all you need. There's value in crumbs. There is sufficiency and significance in crumbs. Ruth got by on crumbs. Elijah got by on crumbs during a drought by the brook Cherith. Jesus even taught, if you have faith the size of a mustard crumb, <laughs> trees and mountains would move and nothing would be impossible to you. God uses crumbs, my friend. He works through crumbs. He saves through crumbs. Didn't he say the crumbs that fall on good soil bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold? Oh, if you've, if you've ever gotten by on mere crumbs before, then you know what I'm talking about this morning. And you know where this powerful Canaanite woman is coming from. 
Jesus' response in verse 28 is as complimentary as his accusation in verse 26 was offensive. Woman, great is your faith. In all of Matthew's gospel, in this entire gospel, only this woman is said by Jesus to possess great faith. No one else, only this unnamed Canaanite supplicant. And since there's an exclamation point at the end of it, woman, great is your faith. This woman wasn't the only one shouting. Jesus himself got to shouting. Let it be done for you as you wish, he concludes. And her daughter was healed instantly. Her great faith led to persistence even in the midst of divine silence. Her great faith led to perseverance even in the midst of discouragement and insult. Her great faith led to humility, to a request for and an acceptance of mere crumbs. But guess what those crumbs did? Delivered her daughter. Guess what those crumbs accomplished? The healing of a dear loved one. Guess what else those crumbs did? They blessed Jesus. Her great faith so impressed Jesus that arguably his messianic understanding took a great leap forward beyond the lost sheep of the house of Israel to embrace the entire world. And he did it here and now in this text because of this woman. Of all the encounters Jesus ever had, with all the people along his path, this one brief eight-verse encounter was but a crumb. And my, oh my, look what can happen with just a crumb. Look at the result. Look at the consequence of just a crumb. Can you thank God for your crumbs, my friends? Can you praise God for your crumbs this morning? Can you honor and magnify his holy name for your crumbs? Mere crumbs. Mere crumbs. That's all it takes. Amen.